I need to talk uh, today about a bitter and ancient rivalry that pits two tribes against each other, locking them in a fierce, permanent enmity that seems to enlist generation after generation in hatred and loathing. But I'm sure you've thought enough about the Arsenal Spurs match and would like to talk about something else. So we'll talk about something else. The billing for Jadov is um, the Jewish talk of our lives, and this is meant to be the Jewish talk of my life. And in a way, it is, uh, in two ways, actually. The first is that the issue I'm going to talk about is one that I've written about, I've reported on, and truth be told, cared about for all of my adult life. And second, it relates to a situation that has uh, obtained and persisted literally throughout my life because I was born in 1967. And that's going to become, the relevance of that will become very clear, I hope. I should also say that I'm making an assumption about, the, uh, about all of you. I'm assuming that most people here want Israel not only to survive, but also to thrive. Not only to have a right to exist, which is the usual formulation, but also to flourish. I'm guessing that, like me, uh, many of you will have strong family ties to the country and that you somehow even if you don't have family ties, you feel bound up with its fate. So that is my starting assumption. The title refers to the real existential threat to Israel. And that phrase, existential threat, particularly in the last few years, is, has been banded around a lot. Uh, usually, uh, I mean, it's understood to mean a threat to the very existence of the state of Israel. And usually it's applied, particularly by the Prime Minister of Israel, to the threat of a nuclear-armed Iran. And I don't mean in any way to play down that threat when I say the possibility and threat of a nuclear Iran is a potential threat. It could happen, but it's potential. The existential threat I have in mind today is real, current, and not theoretical in any way at all. It's not a new argument that I'm going to be making, or that I'm making, but it's uh, become more urgent than ever, and indeed some will say that it's already too late. To frame it and to make it clear, I think you have to begin with asking ourselves what was the purpose of this country called Israel, unusual in the family of nations for being created uh, deliberately in an act of will, of political will. So what was the purpose? And in a way, the word to use here is the dream, the first of these three initials, the, what were the uh, D-O-V, Dov, the dream of those first Zionists was quite simple. It was the self-determination of the Jewish people. And that meant creating a national home where the people would rule themselves. A state, in other words, that would be both Jewish and democratic. That was that founding Zionist dream. And it was understood by them that if you were to take away either part of that uh, equation, the Jewish bit or the democratic bit, that the dream would evaporate, that the project would fail. So that was uh, their starting point. The observation I'm going to make, the O of Dov, of J. Dov, is that that combination has actually been under threat for at least four decades, in fact, for my entire lifetime. The numbers are very hard to come by and are very disputed, but the bottom line is that Israel currently determines the lives, directly or indirectly, of around 5.5, 5, 5 5.5 million Palestinian Arabs in the territory of what used to be called historic Palestine, between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea, the land that people call and refer to as historic Palestine. The number of Jews in exactly that same territory is roughly there about, about 5.9 million. So these two numbers are very, very close together. They may even be closer than that estimate I've said. Some people say they're already more or less equal. And certainly the trend is for these two numbers to be converging. So that's in the territory of Israel proper, as I would call it, the West Bank and Gaza. Take them together. And even and I include Gaza in there because despite the withdrawal from 2005, Israel has control of who and what goes in and who and what comes out. It has control of the airspace, of the seas, the waters, uh, uh, and de facto control of the borders, such as they are. And in the West Bank, the, the, West Bank, the point is more... Obvious, nearly two and a half million Palestinians live there, and they have no democratic say over those who ultimately, not the Palestinian Authority, but ultimately determine their lives, which is uh, Israel. So Israel is now confronted with a choice. If it is a democracy, it should obviously, it just stands to reason, give everybody under its authority a say and a vote. 
trouble is, if that happens, then the state will no longer be Jewish. You've seen the numbers. It will, in effect, be a binational state. And in fact, the way the numbers are going, it'd be very likely to, sooner or later, probably sooner, be an Arab state with a Jewish minority. On the other hand, if it wants to be Jewish, then it means denying those people a vote indefinitely. And then it won't be democratic, the other half of this equation. It will be a state where one half rules the other half. Uh, and eventually the numbers could change, as I said, and you could have a situation where the minority will be ruling a majority. And that's why two Israeli uh, former prime ministers, Ehud Barak and Ehud Olmert, have both warned uh, that there is a possibility, perhaps imminent, of a South Africa-style situation, their words, not mine. Uh, in fact, I don't tend to make that parallel myself because it usually means you then get into a debate about the words and the labels and the comparisons rather than about the substance itself. But when two former prime, minister, uh, prime ministers of Israel, neither of them particularly uh, on the dovish left, then we should listen. Moreover, this is not some remote, far-off threat in the distant future. This headline I'm about to read to you is from this morning's Yediot Akronot newspaper. Ministry launches Palestinians only buses. The Transportation Ministry of Israel sets up designated bus, line, bus lines for Palestinian passengers in the West Bank. And they quote a bus driver who says, from what we were told, starting next week, there will be checks at the checkpoint and Palestinians will be asked to board their own buses. Separate buses for Palestinians, separate buses for Jews. Today's newspaper. And the driver then says to Yediot, obviously everyone will start screaming apartheid and racism now. Well, they will. And that is part of this existential threat too, because if Israel becomes a pariah nation, the world won't tolerate that. We've got experience of that and we know that. It's a moral threat too. Don't pretend that all the Zionists, I don't pretend rather, that all the first Zionists wanted Israel to be a moral uh, state. For some, it was quite enough that it'd be a normal state, just like everyone else. But all occupations do corrode the morality of the occupier. And you saw some of the evidence of that, I think, in the photographs we saw just before. This penny usually drops with Israeli politicians after they leave office, not before. The two I mentioned are examples. The latest is Dan Meridor, former minister in charge of the existential threat that's usually talked about, the atomic threat of Iran, who says, if we continue in the same path we are on today without clear borders, in the end, we'll have one state from Jordan to the sea. And this, in my eyes, represents a threat to the entire Zionist vision. That's a Likud minister, a Likud prince, in fact, he was always known as. So it's not that complicated. You can either uh, hold the territories, Israel won in the year of my birth in 1967, or you can be a Jewish democratic state, but you can't be both. And it does seem as a kind of act of madness, collective madness, because Israel after 1949, after the War of Independence was done, had, after the armistice lines were settled, 78% of this territory historic Palestine. Originally, the idea was going to be more or less 50-50, but Israel ended up after the war that the uh, neighbors started with 78%. And the situation now is that that 78% is being risked because of the desire to have the whole 100%. For the sake of that extra 22%, we could lose the whole thing, or Israel could lose the whole thing. And that is why... Even recently, Ehud Olmert warned that there could be just 10 years left. And he wasn't saying just 10 years left for a two-state solution. He was saying 10 years left for Israel itself. That's the warning. And that's why you see even avowed Zionist Thomas Friedman in the New York Times and Jeffrey Goldberg, a good eminent uh, uh, Israeli-American journalist, talking about self-destruction, or in Friedman's words, saying Israel is on a course of national suicide. Now, I know the counter-arguments to all this. Oh, but there's no partner on the other side. And I would say to that that Mahmoud Abbas and Salam Fayyad may not be about to be the elected chairs of the Hadassah organization, but they're about as moderate representatives as you're going to get. But behind that question is an assumption that somehow a Palestinian state is a reward to the Palestinians for good behavior, that we would be doing them the favor in the Israeli narrative. But once you realize that it's actually Israel's own existential interest to make sure that this land uh, is partitioned as it was always meant to be. Once you realize it's in Israel's own interest to end this permanent grip of the West Bank, then actually you stop thinking of it as a favor 
to the other side, and you start thinking this is something Israel needs to do for its own sake urgently if there is to be an Israel left. Uh, some would say it's only temporary. You know, this will all be sorted out. This occupation is only a temporary thing. When something is, first of all, as old as I am, a 46-year-long uh, occupation, more than twice as long as Israel was without uh, the occupation, without those territories, then it becomes hard to call it temporary. And some will say, oh, well, we need, the, we need that territory for security reasons, for military purposes. And I would say about that, that no military threat is as potent as this one to the very existence of Israel as a Jewish democratic state. Those external threats can be contained and dealt with, but this one is existential. And when people say it will be a terror state on the border, that's always a possibility. You can't give guarantees about that. And what you can say is there's a world of difference dealing with an external threat from behind an internationally accepted border. Israel in this unique situation in the world where it still has no internationally recognized borders. Some people on the left will come the other way and just say, well, all right, what's the, what's the worst that can happen? It will be a binational state. Uh, my answer to that is, if the Czechs and the Slovaks couldn't manage it, if they couldn't live in one shared national home, then pe how do we expect two nations still bitterly locked every day in conflict to manage it? Put simply, if these two couldn't divorce, why on earth would we expect them to be able to get married? And that is what the possibility of a binational state should be. So in my last closing seconds, what should all of us do? What is the vision, the V, in jade of? My view is that the last piece in this jigsaw that's never been seen, the voice that hasn't been heard, belongs to us, the Jewish diaspora. We have not yet spoken about this. Uh, Israel claims and always says it acts and speaks in the name of the Jewish people, the whole Jewish people. Well, the diaspora now has to make clear, I think, uh, that it stands with Israel, that it will always be there to defend Israel, but that it can no longer defend this permanent grip of those territories which threaten the state of Israel's own existence. If I'm right, then Israel's very existence is at stake. But if Howard Jacobson, the novelist who's already been referred to once, is right, that Israel represents somehow a version of ourselves, then this, is, this whole issue is existential for us too. And that's why my vision is that after years of thinking about it and talking about it, we will finally act. Many thanks.